Thank you, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here. And, <clears throat> and the aim of my presentation today is to show uh, certain affinities between Shakespeare's erotic humour and the art, contemporary art, of, especially of the Netherlands, between roughly 1550-1650. Um, when we think of the Netherlands in that period, we must remember that there were two distinct countries as there are today, Holland and Belgium. In, in those times, the, what is Holland today was usually referred to as the United Provinces. And, and, and Belgium was referred to as Flanders. And uh, what was the United Provinces was a, comparable to, to English Puritanism in the sense of religion. It was a, a severe, devoutly, um, devout, Calvinist state, and this is reflected in the arts of the period, quite contrary to the Catholic Flanders, which were conspicuously different in 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 the treat in in, in the general world view. So, uh, for the Protestants in Holland, um, skulls, as in Jonathan's walking stick. <laughs> um, was uh, were omnipresent, conspicuous reminders of death, fragility of beauty, um, uh, transience of life, and and the like. Um, in Belgium, in Catholic Belgium, the attitude, the artistic attitude, was slightly different, or conspicuously different. Um, it was not negation of the earthly, but rather affirmation, the glorification of God's creation. God created wonderful world, wonderful humans with wonderful bodies, and sex was not a calamity that leads us to sin, but one of the joys of life. Uh, so the vanitas of the north was contrasted with the joy of life in the south. And this is when I have devoted the last several years to the study of Shakespeare's sexual erotic puns and the language and so on. And I'm not going to go uh, deeper into, into that because I'm sure you, most of you are well acquainted with that. What struck me while working on the subject is this similarity of sensitivity and attitude between Shakespeare and what we find in his works and, and the Flemish rather than the, the, the severe Calvinist attitude. Uh, let me begin, because I'll show you just several examples. I, I have gathered about 200 illustrations showing how Shakespeare, Shakespeare's sexual punning and erotic punning did not appear out of the blue, but they were, they maybe can be said within a context of what we may say iconosphere of the period. Um, the same sensitivity, the same uh, or similar, similar attitude to to sex, sexual life, to sin. This is a, uh, I'm sure most of you know this uh, painting because it appears on Gary Taylor's edition of, on the jacket of Gary Taylor's edition of, of Thomas Middleton's works. It's Franz Hals um, a painting presenting two strolling players. The gentleman on the side of the figure in the middle and I am using the word figure on purpose because it's not the sex of the, of the figure in, in the middle is not certain. I don't know what you, your impression is. It could be a, a, a young man being an actress dressed up for a role, or it could be a, a woman. Um, 
Uh, it's entitled Shrove Tide, painted around 1616. Um, and the, the, the actor on the left yeah. is the famous comedian Pickle Herring. And the one on the right is Hans Wurst, or Sausage. Mm. Uh, when we look at this painting, one should keep in mind Mercutius' simile of Romeo's body being like a dried herring without his row, and his exclamation, O oh, flesh, flesh, how art thou fishified? Mercutio wrongly assumes that Romeo <coughs> is, is, uh, spent the night with, with Rosaline and, and has been so exploited by her black eye that is unable to stand against Tybalt. As a matter of fact, it was a common belief, this is partly an answer to your question, um, I mean, your, your, your <laughs> question about um, women's lust, that uh, it was a common belief that semen was produced in the brain of man. This is why it was believed that the more ejaculations there are, the less, the, the more stupid a man becomes. <laughs> Some of us might agree with this. Um, <laughs> so so uh, sex, sexual life had a stupefying effect on man. This is why the fear of women was partly justified by, 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 by this. Uh, anyway, Pickle Herring is seated on the left, Hans Wurst on the right. Hans Wurst has his hat. Unfortunately, it's not clearly seen, but his hat is decorated with sausages. His head is surrounded with sausages, which obviously had erotic, uh, evoked erotic connotations. Um, uh, in the middle is, is the young figure, as I said, of unidentified sex. It doesn't, at this point, really matter. But both men are making advances, whether to a young man or a woman, doesn't really matter. Look at this. Yeah. His gesture uh, leaves no doubt what the advances are concerned with. Um, <clears throat> and pickle herring on the left has a necklace of sausages <laughs> representing lust, broken, broken eggshells, which stand for impotence, which is corroborated by this flattened um, bagpipe uh, on the table, His, and dried herrings. Dried herrings also stand for impotence. So what Mercutio says to, 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 to about Romeo is reflected here with these dried herrings. This is a thick strata, which stands for gluttony in iconography of the period. And, and the young person has to make a choice between the two. And apparently she, has, she or he has been fooled by the elderly actor, who is also holding Fox's tail in his right hand. Fox's tail stands for foolery and ability to trick and cheat. So he or she has been fooled by whatever, by the self-limited factor, and is ready for sex, which is a, a, a signal here by this open jar, um, which is a very common feature in, in uh, Netherlands, um, in Dutch and Flemish paintings of the period. When the jar is shut, we are not, we don't want sex. When it's open, we are open to proposals. <laughs> right, so, uh, as you can see, um, the, 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 the painter used all sorts of signs, tricks, whatever, or, or, which is something equivalent to verbal punning in Shakespeare, where everything can not be said explicitly, especially in painting. As I will show later on, engravings and prints were much more explicit. 
uh, than paintings, because you bought paintings to hang them on the wall in your house, right? And, and they couldn't be vulgar, or they could not be literal. This is why, uh, why certain areas of human joys had to be conceived. So, on the surface level, it's a genre scene of people having having a good time. Uh, so, Romeo as a, as a dried herring and his body being fishified, we shouldn't forget that Polonius is also labeled fishmonger. And let me show you a fishmonger. Again, it's not really certain who is the fishmonger, either he or she. But it doesn't really matter to, 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 because of what we see. And um, uh, uh, what is happening here is, is that eggs in the basket. Eggs were a known aphrodisiac. And, and the man's gestures leave no doubt as to his intentions. So with his right hand and with his left hand he's offering a slice of fish, tuna presumably, and as a sort of offer, trade, flesh for flesh deal. Right? His offering. The young lady has plenty of offers like that with fish, and she, and the expression of her thighs shows her lack of interest and so does the jack of <laughs> one. <laughs> um. hmm. Fish were um, a ubiquitous sign of penis. And, and let me show you, and this is an anonymous painting showing a procurus and a prostitute. There is a spider here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and look what she's holding in her hand, right? Fish. It's fish, fish. And, and also we see a cat. A cat was not treated in the way we treat cats, especially in this country. Um, the cat was, was the representative of hell and devilish forces, of temptation, sin, adultery um, and promiscuity, lasciviousness in, in general. Gold, there are golden coins on the table signaling that this is not free service. Um, the fruit are meaningful, plums and peaches, peaches in particular, peaches often, often are signs of uh, male buttocks but not necessarily, but very often they are. Um, not only in, in Dutch paintings or Flemish, but also in Italian, in Caravaggio, for instance, also. This is uh, still life with cat and fish. The cat, as you can see, is guarding his prey, its prey, um, and, but is not interested in eating the fish, right? The cat is, looking at, as if someone was approaching from that end and, and is tempting by what, by what it, it, it possesses. Open um, oysters were known and ubiquitous signs of vagina. Fish of penis. This is really ubiquitous in, 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 in um, Flemish and, and uh, Dutch paintings. The combination of fish and oysters also had the same meaning as uh, mortar and pestle. Here you see a mortar and pestle. Um, and above is a cockerel, which was again a sign of promiscuity. And so was the rabbit. And again, a fish in the hand of the girl, of the young woman. Cabbage was also considered a feminine vegetable. Carrots, as we know from from Mary Wives of Windsor, it, carrots were a good root. 
uh, as Mrs. Quickly says. Uh, again, we have an offer from this gentleman who brings a rabbit representing his readiness for quick uh, sex. <laughs> But she is looking at another direction, so she's not that interested as, and by now we know what this means, right? <laughs> the jack is not open. Here's a typical still life, very beautiful, but it contains a lot and a lot of erotic symbols of the period, and they also appear in Shakespeare. Uh, the instruments. I'll be talking about lutes. We see lutes here. Lutes in detail. Violins, like here. Yeah. And the bagpipe, again, and look, the bagpipe embraces violin. Violin was, of course, female. <clears throat> and we, the cut. Fruits like this obviously have uh, conveyed erotic connotations, um, usually connected with vagina, but not always. I'll show you more uh, figs and plums and peaches also have that meaning. Um, speaking of uh, instruments. Every now and then in Elizabethan Jacobean plays we encounter stage direction, lascivious music played. How did they distinguish lascivious from non-lascivious? They must have had means to distinguish. So um, I suspect that lute music on the whole was considered as lascivious as we have um, in Richard III, surprisingly, we have, in the beginning, in, uh, he, he says that peace is dangerous because peace brings uh, sloth and lechery. He capers nimbly in a lady's chamber. Chamber, of course, is, is, is a pun to, to the lascivious pleasing of, of the lute. And the key words here are, of course, to caper, lady's chamber, lascivious pleasing, and lute. And in the Much Ado, we find a line, when I like your favor, for God defend the lute to be like the case. And the ambiguity of the case and, uh, is, is well known. Right, as in, I mean, there are so many examples of the bawdy usage of the word, and as, as case, uh, as, as, um, Nurse, nurse says, describing Romeo, oh, he's even in my, in my mistress' case, just in her case. <laughs> and, or when Mrs. Quickly complains that my case is so openly known to the world. Um, and Mercutio, of course, who makes fun of Romeo when he says, that's as much as to say such a case as yours constrains a man to bow in the hands. Also, the violin and bow and fiddlestick carried explicit erotic meanings. Lovell in Henry VIII complains about the French courtiers being popular, popular with English ladies. The sly whoresons have got a speeding trick to lay down ladies. A French song and a fiddlestick has no fellow. To which sense answers, let the devil fiddle them. How does one fiddle a lady? In case you don't know, a Spanish, uh, a, a Flemish engraving shows us. No, not this one. Where is, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bagpipes um, had very sim similar meaning, uh, although they could ad imply additionally to messins or dito messins. Um, bagpipes had a, a, a particular, particularly phallic significance in the um, first half of the 17th century and its iconography. Related to this um, uh, dissolute life, 
Um, and in, in, in Flanders, there was a proverb, when the bagpipe is pumping up, one sings better. To sing also in Shakespeare could mean to create with, as in Troilus and Cressida, when Cre Cre where Cressida is said to sing with any man at first sight. Flute as a, is a bellow mender, and he often appears with bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, um, let me show you. Oh, yes. This is an example of lute. This is a typical brothel scene from Flemish paintings, showing a prostitute and the pimp, the procurus, and the young man who is holding money here, and, um, and being enchanted by this charm, tricky melody, and her music. And the lute she's holding, prostitutes often appear with lutes in, in brothel scenes. And, uh, and look, these hands, which are now in the process of making a deal, meet adventurous shades on, on the loot. And, and, and the procurator seems to be pointing at that too. This is the object of the deal. Um, now, the, the... Yes. Yeah, we have a, a bagpipe, a piper, uh, with an elderly lady whose wine jack is wide open. <laughs> And, oh, well, he doesn't look very enthusiastic. <laughs> and, and the sign up there says that you have stolen all my money and destroyed my instrument. <laughs> <laughs> instrument is ambiguous in this, uh, whatever. <laughs> and another one. Uh, this is even more uh, explicit. <laughs> right. Um, but there were other uh, paintings. This is uh, a painting that, that was uh, sold in Sotheby's a couple of years ago. Um, uh, here we again we have violin and fiddlestick and, and the back part of the and the lute here and the wind instruments here. All of these were, were ubiquitous um, sexual and erotic signs. Um, I can't possibly uh, present here, because time is limited, all the uh, relationships and similarities between Shakespeare's text and the paintings and, and graphic art. But even and, and some of the object that objects and, and fruits and, and vegetables that Shakespeare um, um, uh, mentions. For instance, in, in The Winter's Tale, we find the servant saying, he has songs for men or women. He has the prettiest love songs for maids. So without bawdry, which is strange, with such delicate burdens of dildos and fadings, jump her and thump her. Which, which brings us to the, a, rare, a subject that doesn't really appear in paintings, but it does appear in engravings, dildo, it, which, which was introduced, as, as you must know, uh, by Thomas Nash in his um, uh, very bawdy poem, uh, uh, the Merry Ballad of Nash, Nash's Dilda, um, written around 1600. Um, and here we go. Here we have a couple of clouds, falls, both with, with um, asses' ears, as is also the icon of this conference. Right? Yeah. And here we have a large dildo, and of course open vessels of drink, and of course the moral, the moral being, and, and the, these insects are the devilish in nature, 
and, and, and the moral being that drink brings lechery. Uh, this is a funny one. This, <laughs> Again, the devil is false and snatched a dildo from a nun who is chasing, who is chasing, chasing the cat and wants to swap for a fish. Uh, note that, that this little element here, it's, all, it's not really a cross. And in the window like that, oh, we see a clown and this piece of garment is male late medieval underwear. It took me a month to discover that. <laughs> but a male underwear used in the Middle Ages. So the clown has taken this off, showing the nun that even if the cat runs away, he is available. <laughs> okay. Now, do, do you know this? Well, it's at the school of Venus and with, with the stalls selling dildos. It's a, a second half of the 17th century, of course. Um, uh, translation from French. It's, uh, it's very bawdy. But the next thing is archaeological. Look at this. This is a dildo that archaeologists uncovered and excavated in a, <clears throat> a very close to our theater in Gdańsk, um, in, a, in a loo, uh, in a latrine, 17th century. This is an original 17th century dildo. <laughs> is it from abroad? Sorry? Would it be from abroad, though, if it was near the well, this was a brothel district. The street near our theatre was a brothel district, but... Um, what material is it made of? Uh, uh, sorry? What's the material it's made of? Uh, it's wooden and leather on, uh, on the yes. It could be from a brothel, because in Nash's poem that I have mentioned, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Nash himself who, who goes to a brothel, uh, but has a, a premature ejaculation, unfortunately, and the prostitute is, is very dissatisfied, so she says, well, I'll use this little friend of mine, um, and she, she, she praises dildos for two stanzas. Mm. <laughs> um, so that was a problem. Now, um, in Act Two, uh, uh, Scene One of Romeo and Juliet, uh, Mercutio again mocks Romeo, saying that Romeo wished that his beloved Rosaline was like a meddler. Um, meddler was often associated with vagina or, and or with prostitution, because the fruit rots before it ripes. It is. It, it's, it's, it's a rare thing. Before it is ripe, it, it begins to rot. So it was a very appropriate, it was thought, an appropriate simile for prostitutes. And the lines in Romeo and Juliet run in the following. Now will he, that is Romeo, sit under a medlar tree and wish his mistress were that kind of fruit as maids called medlars when they laugh alone. Oh, Romeo, that she were, oh, that she were an open ass, thou poprin pear. And here we have a still knife, and plenish still knife with, with the fruit of the fish. And when it opens, it um, apparently reminded people of, um, of um, openings in human bodies. Uh, right. Um, in many still lifes of the period, we find a visual equivalent of a pun, which uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Is pareidolia? Is this how you pronounce the word? Pareidolia. Um, it's a strange word. It, it's, it, it's used in connection with, with, 
with the psychological effect when you look at an object and it reminds you, for instance, of a different object or a human face. Um, and this is how uh, painters avoided um, literalness. Um, so, for instance, when in when uh, pears and pies and porridge and uh, appear in, in great on a, in a great number of, of um, uh, cases in, in Shakespeare, as when Parolles says to Helena, "Your date is better with your pie." and your porridge than in your cheek. And your virginity, your old virginity, is like our French withered peers. It looks ill. Um, just look at the vegetables here. For instance, here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so it's the vegetables them, in themselves don't carry these erotic com connotations, don't evoke them, but when composed in certain ways, they certainly do. And here you have the cat, the cat who is, which is with, with these vegetables and fruits, and of course plums, we know stewed plums, all of these phrases appear in Shakespeare. Um, right. The abundance of vegetables and and, um, and fruits, of course, was a warning, and the cat is a warning against sinful human nature, against voluptuousness, temptation, and uh, promiscuity. Uh, look at this one here. These are certainly phallic elements here. All fruits, cut fruits, uh, also are very uh, sensual, erotic. Uh, some are m more explicit as here, for instance. <laughs> right. So, uh, uh, as I was saying, I, I just wanted to show you certain similarities between what Shakespeare includes into his, his work and, and the humor that is there, and very often puns are very funny. Um, the affinities um, between that and contemporary paintings and graphic arts on the continent are striking, to say the least. So they belong to one cultural period, one sensitivity, and, and perhaps even not only focus, but almost obsession with human sexuality. That goes without saying. Oh, this is. Okay.